Uh, so it's a great pleasure to uh, have Professor Doug Durin visit us um, from the University of Pennsylvania, where he is doing a random And um, he's going to talk today about brain inspired learning service. All right. Thanks, Budo. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's, it's great to be here for a few months. So, what I'd like to do is tell you about uh, circuits such as we see here, which are composed of identically constructed variable resistors. And the idea is that when we expose these systems to training data, they will self adjust their resistivities in order to learn the desired input output functionality. Okay. And they do it, the cool thing is they do it totally by themselves. There's no external computer, there's no memory, they just do it by themselves. So in that sense, these systems accomplish learning from the bottom up, okay? So to get into why we're so excited about this, so let's contrast this with bottom-up learning of functionality in other systems. Well, there aren't many. Uh, the examples, the only examples I know of, this isn't working, it's okay, whoops. Now the screen is, is frozen. I think we had this trouble with uh, Sorry, the last speaker <laughs> in this room. Yeah. No, look it up. Let me, let me see if this will work now. Yeah, okay, good, awesome. So the trick is to bring up the, um, the buttons in the lower left. All right, so the only examples I know of bottom-up learning functionality are, are, are those found in nature, okay? So here are two examples, uh, both networks. So the vascular network in the brain where these veins and arteries can adjust their, their, their sizes, their conductivities in order to deliver blood flow, you know, more blood to certain regions. And the other example, the ultimate example, of course, is the brain, which is network of, of neurons. And these guys can adjust their connectivities as well as their conductivities in order to, to learn, okay? And they do it in both cases based on sort of local rules, namely what the, the, the experience, you know, what, what they are experiencing. Of course, they know about their connections, okay? But really they're, they're adjusting themselves based on their own behavior and their own interactions with their surroundings, okay? So in that sense, they're, they're really operating under local rules. Let's contrast this with another great learning system, which is a top-down learning system, namely artificial neural networks. And uh, in case you guys don't know how these work, well, the idea is, for example, you want to feed in pixel data uh, to this input layer, and then we'll add up the numbers from all these pixels with certain weights and combine them at this node, do different weights at this node, et cetera, and just propagate it forward. That's the so-called forward problem until the goal is to have an output being one or, uh, you know, uh, this output will sing if it's a dog and this output will sing if it's a cat. And uh, so that's the idea. And uh, to train this, okay, it, it's done using global information and a computer and lots of memory, right? What you do is you, I can bring in, should get too fancy here with, these things, what you do is you define a cost function based on the mistake you make, right? If these weights are not properly selected. The outputs are wrong, so you penalize that. And then you do, then you do gradient descent on the learning degrees of freedom, which are the weights of all these, these edges, okay? And then you drive it downhill. And the way that's done in practice is usually back propagation where you kind of do it one layer at a time. So in other words, to adjust the weight on this edge, we need to know the weights of all the other edges in this layer and what all these, these node uh, values are, are doing. So it's, a, it's quite a global problem. It involves uh, extensive amount of computational power, extensive amounts of memory. If you like, you wanna think about this, this artificial neural network as a little brain. Well, this little brain needs a huge brain uh, in order to both to do the learning as well as to do the the evaluation after it's been trained. So it's quite a different thing. It operates quite, quite differently from, from, from a bottom-up learning system like the brain, and as I'll show you from a bottom-up learning system like the circuits that we've been, been building. 
All right. So in other words, what we want, our goal, and what I want to tell you is how our system uh, is going to lie somewhere between artificial neural networks and real neuron networks. And uh, I'll try to show you that's closer to, to this case. And um, um, to, to begin to make it more real, here's what we kind of have in mind. We're going to have some network, and it's a, it won't usually be so regular as this, and the inputs won't be uh, you know, so clustered on the left versus on the right. But the idea is we'll feed in data through, say, voltage, pressure, you know, stress values, you know, this elastic network uh, on some selected nodes. And then the network will physically compute the outputs. And uh, that's the idea. And uh, we've got to come up with some kind of rule for updating the the learning degrees of freedom, right? The connectivities of the edges, the elasticity of the edges, things like that, in order to achieve the desired functionality. All right. So the things we look at are going to be in the end look more like this, where we distribute the input output nodes more evenly over sort of a randomish network. Okay. And uh, uh, I guess this is a little repetitive of the previous slide, but maybe an uh, interesting point to, to emphasize is that the forward computation. You know, the evaluation is done for free by the physics if we could actually do the training, right? As soon as you apply, but let's restrict attention now to the, the electrical circuit case when, uh, and voltages. So we, as soon as we apply voltages on the red nodes, voltages spring up on the blue nodes. That's your computation, okay? Physics did it for you. That's the forward problem. Now we gotta think about how to train it. That would be the backwards problem. And that's where our story really begins. How in the world are you going to achieve this training? All right. And the trick is going to be a contrastive learning scheme called coupled learning that was invented by Andrea and her postdoc, Naki Stern. Okay. And it's not terribly different from another contrastive learning scheme called equilibrium propagation, but it's a little bit different than we can go into the, the, the technical differences uh, later if you like. Okay, but let me just describe a couple of learning for you. So it's contrasting. So we're going to contrast the behavior of the same circuit under two different sets of boundary conditions, what we call free and clear. Free, this is the way you would like it to be. So you apply the inputs and you read the outputs. Okay. But if it's untrained, these outputs are wrong. So what we're going to do is we're going to clamp the outputs at or closer to the desired values. All right, so two sets of boundary conditions for that, okay? In both cases, the physical degrees of freedom, right, the currents and the voltage drops across each edge, they adjust instantly. The physics does that for you very quickly. And our job then is to figure out how to adjust these learning degrees of freedom, the connectivities at the edges. And, yes, please. Yes. The, the, it could be, it, it could be I, I, didn't, I didn't specify that these were linear edges. They don't have to be. It, but, uh, I will show you cases where they are. I'll show you cases where they're not. Okay, great. So it, it, it can be nonlinear. And, and that'll be important, actually. So it's a good, it's an important question. All right. So, so that was a question. Now my question for you guys. Here's a pop quiz. So which of these... Circuits takes more power to run, the free of the clamp. You would say the clamp and you would be right. Okay. It has to be the clamp physically because you've imposed more boundary conditions. Um, it's dead obvious, actually, in the elastic case. If this were an elastic network and we we're applying the input, as you know, the inputs would be to pull on the input nodes and, and watch the output nodes move certain places. If you grab the output nodes and pull them where they should be and let go, they spring back. Obviously, you store more elastic energy. So the, the, the elastic case is clear. The, you know, the, the, the electrical case is not quite as obvious, but it's, it's basically the same idea. There's some kind of energy functional involved, and it takes more energy or energy per time for the clamped case than the free case. All right. And this actually isn't just a, a fun thing to ask. Uh, it actually enables the whole thing to go. So here's how it works. Um, 
usually, if you're going to do gradient descent, what you do is make a loss function that's, you know, uh, what you got, what you want, square it, because you don't know if it's or negative, right? Do gradient descent on this guy. B can do gradient descent on this difference without squaring it because we know it's positive. The quant power is physically greater than the free power. I don't have to square it. I can do gradient descent on this as my, my, as my loss function, my cost function. So it's a physical contrast function. And let's literally do that calculation step by step. Okay, the elementary calculation. So here it is. Here's gradient descent on that clock function. So kj is the connectivity edge j. So here's how we want it to change with time. Be proportional to minus the partial of the cost function. Okay, so that's gradient descent. Now, the power itself is a global quantity, v squared over r, v squared times k, uh, for the two cases. They have to sum over all the edges, right? Summing over all the edges, this is a global quantity. But since I didn't square it, it's easy to send through this derivative. And what it picks out is the i equals j terms. All the other edges vanish. They don't contribute to the derivative, right? They go away. So all that survives is the difference in the square of the voltage drop across edge j and the clamp in the three cases. This is the update rule. It's purely local. And it's purely local because I didn't have to square it, I don't have cross terms. That's the cool thing. So you see, that's why the pop quiz is so important. It's the physical fact that this difference is positive that allows us to develop a local rule. All right. So that's awesome. Um, Naki and Andrea, of course, demonstrated this in silico. So here's, here's a cool example that they did. Uh, just to classify what well, ones and zeros in the, in the MNIST uh, data set, the handwritten digits. So there's a bunch of digits that uh, they're all handwritten. Here's one example of a zero and a one. So you can see it's, it's pixelized. It's not a huge image, but it's, it, it's an image. And uh, it's got more pixels than their, the nodes in their networks. So what they did, is they did it just a, a, a principal component analysis. They got the top 25 principal components, of these images, and fed them in onto 25 selected input nodes in red, sort of randomly chosen. And then they randomly chose two output nodes that they wanted to sing, whether it's a one or a zero, I'll tell you the difference. So, Who knows? I mean, uh, uh, so I, uh, no, I didn't type. And, and, and so, so you're asking about the architecture of the network. This is something that, that Andrew just grabbed. It's actually from the Verona construction of a jam packing. It's kind of randomly selected. It doesn't matter. Uh, it could be a square grid. It could be a lot bigger. It could be a lot smaller. It could, we could change the, the connectivities of the nodes. We could make it hierarchical. Those are actually hugely important questions that we have not optimized over the space of network structure. We don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so you're getting at something super important that we need to think about. So you're... No, 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 it's a great question because I, I, didn't, I didn't say a word, did I? <laughs> um, and, uh, and it worked, otherwise I wouldn't be here. So, so that's great, but it's an in silico demonstration and it involved extensive computation outside of this, right? There's a computer that, that models this, a computer that has to solve Kirchhoff's laws, the, the forward problem. There's a computer that has to, to store the voltage drops and calculate the updates and tell things how to change. So, so this is pretty computational intensive. It didn't take advantage of the physics. We want to take advantage of the physics by building this in the lab. So you, you, you oh, yeah. constrain two, two, two nodes. So how does it, how does it scale? I mean, you know, you want to constrain more and more nodes. You want to say something about it. Um, so this again is an important question that we don't have a full answer to. Uh, the general rule is that you need a lot more degrees of freedom than, than constraints, okay? So in this case, 
you can, you can see that's the that, that that's true. There's there's many many more edges than there are constraints here, and as long as you're in that limit, there's lots of solutions and you can find one pretty easily. It's the same rule of thumb for constructing artificial neural networks. You want it to be you know underdetermined by some some fairly large amount. But as you as you increase the number, then you may get stiff or something. It's harder to find. It might get easier because there's more solutions. And there we know how the problem is up to So then um not directly. I think there are a lot of results that are shown, but it's really quite fundamental. And here everything occurs on the edges. So they're they're combined on the nodes, right? The node is the the node is where you collect all the information. That's where you have for example here. That, that's what the side that is the function of the node. Whereas here um here it's not so so you know all these things that are actually known for are in the only thing I don't know how much it's um so directly but but the scaling does need to be mm -hmm. Before more than just sorry, oh, yeah. you're about to tell us how to solve the elastic problem using physics. But before you even did that, you did the PCA. So I guess you're assuming the PCA is always been done. But did you do PCA in front of the Uh Yeah. <clears throat> and this is kind of a cheat. And okay. they could have used far fewer components. They could also could have downsampled the images. Yeah. And that, and that works too. Actually, Sam, the postdoc, I'll tell you about in a sec, uh, has, done, has done that. All right, so how are we going to do this physically in the laboratory? Well, it's, it's not so hard to get your hands on variable resistors. There's these little devices here called Digibots. You can buy them, you've got these little pins, stick them into a breadboard. And if you give a TTL pulse, a little voltage spike to one of the nodes, it'll cause the resistance to go up a notch, give it pulse another another pin it'll go down a notch and the ones that we're going to work with have 128 different resistance values that are evenly spaced so these are our variable resistors those are easy to get we could easily put these in the breadboards and hook up networks and you know that'd be great uh but it would be kind of silly to then go around and physically measure the voltage drops you know apply apply the free 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 conditions go around measure the voltage drops write them down or you know uh, instrument it so it can be done with with a computer, uh, right? You know, store them, uh, then then go go around and uh, apply the, the the client boundary conditions. Go around and make all the measurements, and then and then figure out how to do the updates. That'd be kind of silly. I would not be taking advantage of physics uh, in a very good way. So, how are we going to do that? How can we get around the the use of an external uh, processor and memory. Well, our trick is instead of to take the same circuit and apply clamped 
and then apply free, we're going to take two circuits that are identical twins and apply both boundary conditions simultaneously to the respective circuit. So one of the twins, and these live right on top of each other, and they're identical. One twin will be running the free boundary conditions. One twin will be running the clamp boundary conditions. They're on top of each other, so we can compare the voltage drops across corresponding edges and develop our couple learning one. And here's an example of one of those edges. So this is just one edge. So here is one variable resistor that runs the free in the free circuit. Here's the other variable. Here's the identical variable resistor in the identical resistance state that's uh, being subjected to. Uh, it's part of a network running the clamp boundary conditions. That's what we do. And then the rest of the circuitry is designed to compare the voltage drops across these two guys and implement an update. And instead of implement, implementing the, the actual coupled learning role, we're going to implement an approximate one. We're just going to go up or down one click, depending on which voltage drop is higher. Okay, so it won't go downhill as fast as it could, but it should still go downhill. And uh, when it stops moving, it should still have minimized our cost function. Okay, and uh, and it works. Okay. So here is Sam Dillavu, fantastic postdoc who built this. And here is his first example of a bottom-up learning system. Okay, actually I think the world's first example of a bottom-up learning system. All right, so it's kind of hard to see the network structure. So we superimpose this blue grid and it's kind of randomly, uh, Budo is kind of randomly put together. Okay, <laughs> but uh, Sam, had the, the, the patience and the fortitude to build 16 edges, and he hooked it up with, with nine nodes, uh, such as shown here. So we've got nine nodes that we can use for inputs and outputs, and uh, let's, let's see how it works. Okay, so here is an example of something that uh, Andrew likes to call an allosteric task. It's a one, it's a one, it's, 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 it's a single input output relation. So, but, but involving multiple nodes. So for example, uh, these three red nodes will be our inputs, say zero, one, and five volts. And the three purple ones will be our outputs. And what we want is for them to be three volts. So that's the goal. That's the functionality, a very simple functionality, very simple allosteric functionality for this nut, as simple as it can get. Um, it's kind of like a, a fancy voltage divider, okay? Correct. That, that's where, uh, where the, you know, where the learning coming in. I'm sorry, I'm being very slow. Um, whether they're going to be three boards or two boards, that's going to be set up by the connecting, the resistor of the connecting. Yeah. If you, each edge has a resistance, yeah. and if you apply zero, one, and five volts, if you just choose resistors at random, these three guys will not have, they will not be three volts. Yeah. They'll have some other value. And then the idea is to adjust the resistances so these become three volts. And we want it to do it automatically. We want it to do it automatically. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. So the update rule that I showed you before is, right, this is for how to change the resistance at each step. So would you say that the problem is safe to tell it? Uh, uh, what's there to say? Right, yeah. you're, you're you're gonna you're gonna look at the voltage drop. They're, they're they're identical resistors, but they're in circuits with different voltages applied to them, so different currents through them. Therefore, they have different voltage drops. So we just look at this. The circuitry just looks at the voltage drops and decides which one is bigger, and clicks it up or down a notch. And how do you see your the notch? Oh, uh, that's set by the the device itself. So this particular device that we bought has 128 notches. Okay. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, look, the max on the smallest notches. Look, that is like how fast we are taking that. Uh, that's right. So, so we just go up or down one notch, and sometimes it's sort of indeterminate; it doesn't do much. Okay, uh, but but that that's it. And but and it's not really exactly the amount it should go up or down. So it's not an optimal update rule. So it's a, for sure. Some kind of back. Yeah. 
Yeah. Correct. It's not a clock. So there's a clock. So this is a digital circuit, and like digital circuits, there's a clock that's running in the background, and that controls how fast the whole thing works and in, in, in real time. And they're synchronized. They're synchronized. There's a global clock. Uh, you could call it that, but but hold that thought. I'll have more to say on this exact point later. So you're reckoning something one uh, the the free and plant are on the same clock. Yeah, they're they're really they're really together. They're kept everything is kept in sync. So it helps the the state of the plant. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Does the free adopt and does the free sort of change? Uh, yes, it does. So this the this learning rule is applied to both circuits. Yeah. And the behavior. You know, where, where they go up or down depends on pull. Yeah. All right. So uh, this. Uh, it's it's really there's a there's a. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, the, the differences are the voltages applied to the clamped output nodes. The, the, the inputs are the same. Sorry? In, in practice, you apply a voltage to the upward nodes in the clamp circuit. <clears throat> yeah. So literally we apply. Let's turn back. Literally we clamp it by applying a voltage to the outputs for this clamp circuit. Yeah. And uh, um, <clears throat> yeah. All right, so here we go. This is supposed to show that it worked within about 50 training steps. The, the difference from three volts, square it, well, square it, the mean square difference from three volts for the three outputs, these are the three purplish curves, uh, dive down to zero. The black is their sum. Well, it's not zero, but it's as close to zero as we can get with, with our circuitry, okay? so. So it, it achieved the goal, it achieved the goal. So this uh, is an example of, of learning, a very simple example. Let me show you a more complicated example, uh, linear regression. So instead of learning one input output relation, try to teach it how to, to, to take a weighted sum of the two inputs. And for this, what we do is we create training data set composed of different uh, input values. And we, we, we show it, the desired outputs, okay? And then we test it on different, uh, different, uh, different, different, different uh, values that it hasn't seen. And you can see it does the same thing. Um, with time, then some, some number of training steps, uh, the mean squared error uh, has gone down as far as it's gonna go. So we've, we've learned, okay? Uh, here's the most complicated uh, uh, thing that we've trained the circuit, this particular circuit to do. Uh, it's to classify uh, iris flowers. So there is a, this is like a baby uh, uh, AI data set, okay? <laughs> We're doing image classification. So uh, not much of an image to it. There's just four numbers. So you, someone, you know, 100 years ago or so, uh, took 50 flowers from three different species and made four measurements on each flower, wrote them down. And you can get this, uh, you can download this data set. So uh, we've got three species, so there's gonna be three outputs. We've got four measurements. So there's gonna be four, four input nodes. Uh, and we picked the fifth as a ground. And uh, so there we go. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. And these guys were selected pretty much at random. And uh, 
They, unlike an artificial neural network, we can't make the, the output nodes be ones and zeros because we're talking about voltages here. So what we do is we look at just the mean square difference between um, between this between the node and uh, the members of the species. Use use that thing to to, to, to do the classification. And uh, every epoch, when we show it, you know the, the training data set, right, a portion of all these numbers. Um, we update what the target is going to look like. And uh, you can see that after some number of training steps and a few epochs, uh, you've learned about as well as you can. And in fact, uh, the training accuracy is about 95%, a little better than 95%. And this is really is as good as you can do with a linear classifier. With a nonlinear classifier, you can do like 97% with this data set, it's just a little bit better. So we've done about as well as you can. You know, Well, um, I, I lied that if I said we fed in a picture. <laughs> we we fed in four numbers that represent the measurements of the pedal uh, and, and sepal, you know, length and width. Yeah. Yeah. The ground, uh, we just set this to zero. We translate these numbers to voltages between zero and five. We just like to have a ground in the circuit. I'm not sure we totally need it, but we put it in. Yeah, we're trying to build up from simple to complex and from small to large and to try to understand the the dynamics of the learning and and the ins and outs is you know how to how to program quote unquote this thing kind of as we go you know we're making it up <laughs> there's no guidance here yeah. so we're feeling our way through different measurement of the the same space. Yes. So we've 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 done that. We've done that. You can pick a different subset of the whole thing as the training data set, and you get the same response as long as you have enough. Oh, great question. So um, maybe this next slide will get at that. Maybe it won't. Um, um, <clears throat> But basically there's lots of solutions. There's more than one solution. And depending on where the system started, which exact training set you show it, you'll land on a different one. And even after you land, it turns out that in our circuit, there's a little bit of a drift and the resistance value drift around. So this guy, this resistance hit the rail, but this one kept drifting around, but the mean squared error stayed constant. So you're exploring solution space a little bit with this drift. Yeah, so, so this wasn't actually meant to illustrate or to answer your question. It was meant to, to show that the thing is flexible. It can do one thing after another. It doesn't really matter which nodes you select. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can control it. So the what? There's a... Uh, I, I, I don't know that we really got to the bottom of it, but I, I should say that the two circuits are not perfectly identical, right? They're as identical as we can make them, but they're not truly identical. So I think that in and of itself will cause some, some issues, okay? Yeah, um, say that again? It could be like software. Change something to read the freedom in some different way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so like an infinitesimal noise would cause, would cause drift if you're soft ones. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I totally buy that. Um, I don't think that numerical roundup error in the simulations is enough to cause that, is it? I think when Naki does the simulations, it trains, the error goes down to numerical precision, it just sits there. Right, without the resistances drifting. 
So is there is there a minimum uh, connection that can solve the problem? A minimum connection. You, you've got to have at least enough learning degrees of freedom to match the number of constraints you want to satisfy. And you have to have more. That's correct. That's right. That's totally right. Yeah. Uh, in the lower in the artificial neural network communities, you want to have a lot more. You want it to be vastly underdetermined. But it's a good problem. Yeah. All right, so here's another feature that's important for what we want to go with this is that it's, that it's actually really robust to damage. So by contrast with computers, if you if you ruin a little bit of the circuit, you ruin the whole darn thing. Uh, you know, the neural networks in your brain are not so fragile. You can damage the brain quite extensively and it can still have quite a high degree of functionality. Um, our circuits are, are more like the brain in this regard. So we can come along and snip edges and see what happens. And we can snip a large number of edges and we'll still train. We can snip a large, we can snip edges and sometimes we don't even have to retrain. And actually this is really um, what happens more frequently than not. Actually, most edges are kind of irrelevant. You snip them and nothing happens. Um, so these were not selected random. Sam, for some reason, selected the ones that haven't had a big effect. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but the reason why this is so important for us is that it's going to make it possible to make large numbers of networks because for sure when we scale up there's going to be broken edges okay and if we have broken edges circuit's not going to care it's just going to train around them so that's going to be a good thing uh, in fact it was funny when Sam was 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 building these circuits and debugging them and trying to see how they work. He saw some, they would they would train up, but their their behaviors would be a little bit odd and reproducible. It turns out sometimes there were broken edges and you didn't even know, okay? It, it just worked, it just worked. So it, it's totally different from any other experiment I've done where you gotta get the whole thing to work and for it to work. This one doesn't care. <laughs> as long as we got a few twin edges that are functioning, it can learn. <laughs> Uh, if, uh, they are, I mean, they are real, right? Yeah, real time. Yes. So uh, you have uh, a minimum uh, precision. That's correct. And you take this into account, they, they just compare it. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the voltage goes down to some noise floor. Yeah. It's set by the precision. Yeah. Um, I just want to maybe oh, yeah. give um, maybe counter a little bit spit, I think, because computers are fragile, but uh, deep learning networks are not. So, you, know, you can, so, you know, so in some sense, you, if, you're, if I was to compare this with a sort of standard global learning, that's also pretty robust as well. I can make small changes to network. You know, it doesn't really affect how, how well I learn. As long as I've got the right connectivity. This is true, but in the, in the same regard, people. So this is something I, I need to understand better. People that are in the business of building hardware to mimic artificial neural networks or neural networks, they work really, really hard to build in redundancies to get around manufacturing defects. Manufacturing defects limit their ability to scale up. In a way that I think we're not going to be susceptible to. There's something to do with scales. I mean, the really the training process is so, yeah. And then after training the network, then the network can also learn uh, using uh, an artificial network? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you damage it, it can learn the thing. Right. But but mm -hmm. you don't know what damage you've done. So 
you have to know exactly what it is you've got in order to be able to do things. All right. So asynchronous learning. The brain doesn't have a clock. So let's remove the clock. Or to some extent, remove the clock. So uh, it's a digital thing, so we can't totally remove it. What we can do is we can put a little bit of extra circuitry and control a fraction of the edges that update. So the lights that are blinking, those are the ones that are updating. So we've got a knob we can tune here to control which fraction update. And this is work done uh, by an undergraduate. Okay. And uh, here's the mean squared error then against the versus training steps for updating all of them at once or down to And you can see that it still trains. Okay. Of course, if you're only updating a fraction, it takes you longer to train, but you know it scales with the, the fraction. So. So that's all cool. Um, if you look closely though, there's a feature here. Uh, if we update a small fraction, we seem to have a better mean squared error. And that holds. So the mean squared error goes down as we update a smaller, smaller fraction. And uh, this actually, uh, we think maps on this on the, on the stochastic gradient descent where you give the system a little bit of inertia in one direction. So it can, it can, uh, you know, it can, it can, it can get over little, 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 uh, little, you know, subsidiary minima and get you deeper. Okay. So that's a cool variation. Um, another variation is, is, uh, the 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 scale of the plasticity of the brain is comparable to the uh, the rate at which it learns. So the brain is learning pretty fast on the scale which signals propagate around. And our first version that wasn't the case. Physically, the currents sprang up and equilibrated very very quickly compared to how fast we were updating the circuitry. We can turn that around. We can slow down the learning. Okay, we can't speed up how fast we do the updates, but we can slow down the learning by putting great big old capacitors across the resistors, slow things down. And if we do that, remarkably, uh, in simulation and experiment, we can, we, can, we can still learn. So when the learning rate becomes comparable, because, well, if, it's, if the learning rate is smaller than the circuit equilibration rate, of course, nothing happens. But as we approach those two rates being equal, and go a little bit up above it, we still, still see, we see no gradation, degradation in the mean squared error. Okay? You gotta go a little bit above it. And if you go far enough above it, of course, you know, bad things happen, but remarkably, you can still do some learning out of equilibrium. So that's kind of nice. I'll skip power optimization and go to variation number four. Uh, where we've got a second generation of circuitry now. We're gonna get rid of the clock. We're gonna get rid of the digital updates. We're gonna to try to implement the exact couple learning role using transistors. And here's Sam again with the second generation, the prototype of the second generation. Here's what one edge looks like. It's a mess. There's a bunch of stuff going on there. Uh, for us, all we need to know is that the learning degree of freedom is now essentially the gate voltage. So you change the gate voltage, you can change the effective resistance, how easy it is for current to get through this, this guy, okay? And uh, 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 so it's a, it's a non, in, well, it's a nonlinear resistive element. So um, um, if you have low gate voltage, okay, and the resistance is low, here there's resistance, it's pretty much constant. But as we go to low gate voltage, resistance gets higher. Now look at this, it's not constant. It depends on the voltage on either end, okay? So it's a nonlinear element. It's not very nonlinear, but it's definitely nonlinear, okay? It's in, well, I mean, not at all nonlinear down here. And here the nonlinear is you know, only a factor of maybe 10 at most. So it's not the most nonlinear thing you can imagine, but it's definitely a nonlinear element. And being nonlinear, 
maybe that will allow us to achieve greater functionality. So for example, the XOR function, there's no way you can learn this with a linear circuit because the outputs are not a linear combination of the inputs. Can our circuit do it? Yes, it can. So this is supposed to be a movie. Sorry, it is actually playing. And uh, um, uh, so it's a, it's a small network now in a square grid. And the width of the edges represent the conductivities. And the colors of the nodes represent the node voltages. And uh, these, these are four instances showing the four different cases of, you know, uh, true, 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 false, 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 true. And the inputs are the way we, we, we feed it is with the voltage across, uh, uh, sorry, the, the way we feed it, input one will, uh, will be true if this is a positive, uh, we impose a positive voltage uh, increase across the two nodes, false if a positive increase in this direction across these two nodes, and uh, ditto down here for these two nodes. And you can see that with time, uh, the outputs are uh, the zeros here. If the inputs are the same and they're non-zero, the inputs are different. And you can also see that the, that the system found a way to be nonlinear because the connectivities are not the same in the four pictures. So there's a lot to look at, but it, uh, it did the job. And uh, this next picture shows a, a more easy to look at case of, uh, of, of a nonlinear uh, capability of the circuit, a classification problem, where the goal is to give it two inputs uh, and to classify whether the combination, you make a scatter plot of it, lies inside or outside of this sort of central elliptical region. So the goal is to, cl to correctly classify it, right? Uh, you want the ones inside the look blue, the, we call them blue if they're correctly classified and, and you know, for the ones here, and goal if these guys are correct, correctly classified as being outside. And at time zero, the decision boundary was really a line going across here. So the darker colors mean a mistake. You know, darker should be blue, right? So the thought it was, in the sun, right? So it didn't work. And with time, eventually, it was able to work. So quite nonlinear. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this system learns in a very different way. So you're already going from uh, analog to uh, to uh, make it physical. Uh, <clears throat> this is implementing an XML. Yeah. You know? So these are these are yeah, so these 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 are small circuits and there's a limit to the complexity, the functionality that they can achieve because they're so small. 
and the XOR and this classification problem are just demonstrations of the capabilities of the system. They're not meant to be, okay, this is the way I'm going to calculate XOR from now on. The idea is to is to be able to uh, to learn things. Yeah. So the proof would be able to learn things on its own by both of you. That's what they get. So it's really different from you know programming computer something. Like the power of the now, oh, yeah, you know, in the sense that there are lots of nodes, and then lots of mass people try to, you know, map them in two degrees or the near each other, and not, they have too many connections. Uh, so, in that sense, they're not local. We're embedding the high dimensional system, two dimensional system. I don't entirely understand what the uh, Constraints have been imposed on this system, which makes it very different from that ultimately my mission here. And as the thought progresses, these constraints need to be relaxed. And uh, anyway, a lot more layers. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so let me just wrap it up. So just to conclude, so we've got this twin network implementation of the local couple learning role that Andrew Naki came up with. And uh, this really is the first laboratory example, I believe, of a system that can train itself, okay? Can train itself to do tasks, self-learning. And uh, in the end, it involves a double graded descent, right? So physically, you know, to relax the physical degrees of freedom, that's doing physical, that's doing uh, great, you know, it's, 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 it's doing great descent on the, the physical degrees of freedom. The currents are relaxing to minimize an energy functional. And it's also doing great descent on a learning cost function during the training phase to, um, to, to achieve the, the functionality that you want. So in the end, we've got physics then doing the forward problem for us. We impose the inputs, the outputs get calculated basically quickly and for free. And uh, circuitry, this twin circuitry solves the local problem of how to adjust the edges, okay? And that's physics enabled because it's based on the couple learning rule, which is based on the, the, the physical uh, fact that the clamp boundary conditions cost more energy or just more power than under the free boundary conditions. So physics helps us a lot in, in both cases. All right, so we've demonstrated some tasks <clears throat> and some variations, and uh, and uh, here's kind of the outlook. So um, should be massively scalable, okay? So uh, so um, this should, we should be able to make much bigger networks that can do uh, much more complicated things very, very quickly. So even the, the, the first generation digital version, okay, should outperform not the simulation for a task involving a network that's only 100 times larger because he's got to do the problem of solving Kirchhoff's laws. He's got to do the forward problem every single step along the way. We don't have to do that. So, um, so that's a huge advantage, both not just for evaluation after training, but for, for training itself. During training, you've got to evaluate the forward problem a lot. Uh, you do it in silico. So, so this is a good thing. Um, now that we've got 
a platform with, with transistors, we can microfabricate it. And with that, we can be able to scale up just using ordinary 180 millimeter microfabrication uh, technologies, should be able to get on the order of millions of edges per chip. Okay. And these things will be fast and, uh, and uh, they won't consume a ton of energy. Uh, we're not ready to go there yet. First, we're going to do is put those same chips as Sam breadboarded onto a printed circuit board. And then we can do a little bit of a uh, little bit more testing, um, um, put together networks on the order of, you know, hundreds of hundreds of edges. Okay, so with this, we should be able to do hundreds of edges, and then we'll be ready, I think, to microfabricate. So um, there's lots and lots of open questions and new directions that we need to think about more carefully. Um, the nonlinearities in our case are on the edges. Andrew mentioned this as opposed to neural networks, the nonlinearities being in the nodes, we combine the, the values with certain weights. So the nonlinearity is coming in a different way. So um, for neural networks, there's the universal approximation theorem that tells us that you can approximate any input output relation you like. We don't have that. Can we have that? Okay. Uh, what kind of nonlinearity would be needed? Okay. Certainly not the nonlinearities of. I mean, certainly the nonlinearities of our current transistors are probably not optimal. Okay, what is optimal? Um, what about network topology? What connectivities and how, how, how hierarchical should it be? Neurons in the network and vascular networks are famously hierarchical. Can we gain some functionality by making these hierarchical? So we need some guidance here. Um, what's the capacity to learn? Right? How many things can I learn at once? And how does that depend on the nonlinearities? Um, if you learn one thing, does it forget another? Okay, memory issues. Um, um, if you want to get real, you want to think about, you know, I, I, I would say that in the end, we should be we should be able to do almost anything with this that you could do with an artificial neural network, but we're not going to disrupt that industry probably anytime soon. But maybe there are niche applications where being blazingly fast and analog would be super helpful. Um, our colleague, Mark Miskin, is interested in this with regards to uh, swarms of robots. So putting these things in there and letting the robots learn things would be a cool thing. Um, can we do the similar trick in other kinds of networks? So basically, any kind of network for which you can assign a functional, we can, energy functional, we can do um, the couple learning trick. So microfluidics uh, map directly onto electronics. That's easy. How about mechanical networks? The elasticity, you know, forces bouncing at a node, those are vectors rather than scalars. So they're a little bit different. They're more complex, but but uh, uh, we, can, we can go down this road. There can be some cool things there. Um, can we think about biophysical networks? Uh, as 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 learning in 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 the same kind of sense that our circuits are learning from the bottom up, can we can we think about how our systems learn and how biophysical systems learn, compare and contrast, and learn some things? One reason I'm here. Okay, and uh, really, then how can we think of learning as an emergent process? Okay, that emerges from simple local rules from the bottom up. How does learning emerge? And with that, let me acknowledge uh, the team. So experiments were done by, uh, Sam was involved in everything I showed you today. Uh, he directed some undergraduates to do some of the side projects. Lauren Allman is just joining. She's testing the printed circuit boards and she's doing things in mechanics. Naki and Andrea are the theory team. Naki, uh, in particular, I want to give a shout out to Mark Join for the second generation. He's a real expert in uh, microfabrication electronics. He helped us out with the design of the second generation circuits. With that, let me stop and see if I can field some more questions. Thanks. So questions working?
here, but to change something to prevent the building movement. And this was all based on the generic Yep. And then when you get the building you get the building <clears throat> Uh, so the answer depends on the clamping. So what I didn't tell you about is that when we clamp, we don't drag it all the way to the final value. We nudge it from where the free case is slightly towards the clamp case so that the two circuits are not so vastly different. That way, the linear update rule still works. We are uh, for a complicated enough tasks, we also have to nudge it. It works better. There is no like self assembly, self assembly of structure, right? Things will self assemble based on their own interactions with each other, right? There's no blueprint telling people how to make it. And the uh, you show so 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 okay so this is this is supervised it's supervised learning okay so so maybe maybe you don't want to maybe you don't want to call that bottom up okay but but really it's doing its updates by itself. There's no comp, there's no external computation involved. The sister is updating itself, not knowing what other other researchers are doing. Their voltage from the And yeah, it's not doing global, you know, global gradient descent. You need to know everything about everything in order to figure out what direction. Take it. Right. So the issue is the uh, backlog. The issue is backlog. So you're, you can compute local updates without backlog. So that's what it's done. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, so going back to the question about the, the, when you, you nudge things slowly, you wait for them. Um, so that, that suggests some kind of adiabatic. Uh, some, there's some kind of adiabatic information or something, if you, if you think. Um, and which you have uh, um, a sense in, in what's the thing that's, what's the, what, what's the thing that you need to wait to, to relax? We, do another little nudge. <clears throat> so at each training step, yeah. you 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 expose it to training data. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if the conditions are different, the nudge will be a little bit different. If there's circuitry that figures out how much of a nudge to give it, what the clamping should be. Um I could stop my whole screen thing here. I have some hidden slides. There we go. So here is the tiniest network you can imagine. It's two edges. It's it's a voltage divider. So you apply five volts here, ground here, and you want a certain target here. And in this plot, um, the target is is uh, 3.75 volts until 100 training steps. Then we switch the target to be 2.5 volts. Then we switch again to be one volt, switch again to be 2.5 volts. So that's the uh, the target. And um, you can see that the clamp boundary conditions, well, so at time zero, there's the free value. It's wrong. We want the free to get up to clamp. So on the, nut, on the clamp circuit, we nudge it halfway there. Halfway from where it was to where it goes. At this point, it's a little closer, so we don't nudge it as far. 
etc. So there's how far you nudge it, right? How far you go from where you're at to what you want to be. You could nudge it all the way, you can nudge it halfway there, nudge it a tenth of the way there, and that will control the relaxation for sure. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if you just really sort of just got some ad hoc in the way that like you choose it to be halfway. Um in this one we have an optimal way to there might be an optimal way. Yes, there's probably an optimal way. If you make it, if you make the nudge too small, then it can't it can't find it. If you make it too big, then it wanders all around and you also can't find it. After your your network has left, right? Can you uh, just put in uh, some slightly different input and it will give the right thing? I mean, how about just like the learning? Oh, like this one. Yeah. So if you if you want it to be, uh, say, say one volt, you apply five volts. And then it goes. But if I apply different, if I apply 4.5 volts, this will just change in linear proportion. Right. So it'll, it'll it'll be it'll be different. Okay, so um neural network. Uh you do you you know the pattern there, right? It's not learning, it's not learning uh it's not the same thing as learning uh Okay, so uh, I'll talk to you. Okay, so yeah, so you can, yeah, we tested on out of training, you know, we tested on on, on, on data, you know, the, the classification, the, the yeah. linear regression. Yeah. We tested on, on on test data that's not in the training set. Yeah, yeah. here there's, you can't make a distinction between, you know, training data sets and outer training. <laughs> Right, not not in the simple example, but in those other cases, you we can. definitely, we definitely, we absolutely tested on how to how to train said data. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good example to see the drift. So the ratio is constant, but the two things drift, but it maintains a solution. Until one of them hits the rails, right? Middle power, right? Yeah. Can you just learn sequence? Uh, yeah. So we, I mean, it just go there, then we, it goes up and uh, goes on other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that's what we did here. This actually, I didn't, well, I didn't dwell on it or not. But this is in sequence. So we went from doing classification to different allosteric tasks to regression, one after the other. So we we did do it in sequence. So you can you can train it like that. Um, it for, it's a linear network and it's small, so it forgets what it's learned previously. It forgets. So right, one of the things that's important, well, we think would be interesting to think about is. To what extent can it retain memory of what it's learned? Can you train it to do one thing, then train it to do something else? Okay, certainly, actually, Sam has done it. He, you can train it to do two different tasks simultaneously. Whereas if you train it to do those tasks one after the other, it forgets the first one. But I can train it to do them simultaneously and it can do it. So 
let's thank God once again for uh, speaking about. Thank you.